Welcome to The Artist Report. I've got Josh Ariza here. He is a friend, um, epic, epic dude. Um, he is a designer and illustrator, runs the most popular company in Orange County called Chomp Brand. It's a <laughs> clothing company. Um, but just going to hear a bit of his story and where you came from. And then um, we're going to be talking a lot about the bridge between working for bigger companies and then going into freelance and okay. sort of how that's been going. Um, because I remember talking with you through that whole process and sort of seen some pretty killer success that's come out of that. Oh, yeah. Well, um, no, I mean, it's, it's, it was a terrifying move for yeah. sure. <laughs> uh, but could you give just a little bit of a background on, you could give a short background on like coming out of Florida and, and would love to hear, even like, is there anything from your family and growing up that's sort of driven you to where you are today? Yeah, I would say uh, been designing and drawing pretty much my whole life. Design, you know, later back in, in high school, I was in kind of a magnet program where, you know, I learned how to use some of those tools. <clears throat> and then, you know, I had always kind of admired my older brother and he went into graphic design. So uh, uh, he seemed to really like it. And, it, you know, it, it took the skill set that we kind of had and then and then and used it as a career. So I was like, you know, maybe I'll do what he's doing. He kind of went the web web route, you know, the web design interface stuff. And then I went more of the, you know, strict pen to paper kind of illustration. But um, yeah, so that was a huge influence on me. So I went to design school. I was uh, I, I cherry picked my design school. I visited a few of them and I was like, which one's the best one? You know, I had kind of a, a mentor of mine who was explaining to me which schools had the best programs. And I, I chose a school called Flagler. And then shortly after I graduated, I got a, 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 a relocation package to move out to California. You know, so I've been here for like eight years. I worked for Billabong. That was the first job that I took outside of my career. So was it Billabong that so straight out of design school you got hired and Billabong flew you out? Yeah, Billabong uh, just get, they gave me like five grand. They're like, here you move out here with this. It's kind of like a uh, what do you call that when you get a, like when rappers get like a, a deal, but then oh they get an advance. So I got a salary advance. <laughs> I got my rapper deal advance, yeah. and they gave me part of my salary fund to move, which is just unreal because it's like they took a huge risk on me. I had never had a real job before. Um, and I hadn't designed that much apparel before, but they they wanted me out there. And honestly, it was one of the most uh, awesome experiences. Learned so much there. And and the guys who hired me are still kind of mentors, and they advise me. They even advise me on the stuff that I'm doing now. Um, and uh, and so that's kind of how I got out here. And then took a a few years there, and then and then moved over to Nike, um, and and had a few years there. So I mean. Did you go straight to Nike? Nike, or were you at Hurley first, and then Nike? I never went. I never worked at Hurley. I feel like a lot of people think I might have because um, my my office was right on their campus. So yeah, you know. Um, but um, yeah, and then I worked on women's sportswear. So I worked on like the the skateboarding, surfing side, and then I worked on women's sportswear and little girls products. So I was designing for little girls and stuff. So I always wonder, like these little girls know, like when they're kicking around a soccer ball, that it's like some. 30 year old guy drinking a beer like drawing their little pixie drawings or whatever <laughs> and the, and they're wearing them out on the soccer field so it's kind of funny totally <laughs> um go, going back when just even before you went to design school you had a mentor um how did you end up was that just a family friend how did you end up yeah so it was actually a family friend yeah there's a I believe in mentorship like a lot. So I mentor a couple kids who have straight up asked me like, will you be my mentor? And then there's other people who will just like ask you questions and they want to want help and guidance. And that happened a lot for me when I was, when I was growing up, not, not just with my older brother and like looking up to him, but, um, also his mother-in-law was the head of a, a design program at a, at a community college. And she was like a really big influence over me. It was like, here are the schools that I think are the best. And I think you should go visit those schools. And, and so she kind of guided me along the way. And, and you kind of cherry pick your mentors. You know, some of them don't really know that they're mentoring you. There are guys who you can throw questions at, but then there are other guys who, you know, I've actually said like, will you mentor me? Will you, you know, teach me about your business? Will you teach me? And, and they actually talk real numbers about what the kind of numbers that they're selling and, and where your margins to be. And they explain a lot of things that maybe just a normal friend would, might not give that information to you. And, and I, most of my career has been kind of like me hanging on to the shirt tails of these guys as they walk their way to success and me just riding along, you know, almost like, uh, you know, how Jack White 
like got to success, but then Meg White was just like, I just kind of play drums. So I'm the guy who just kind of played drums and everyone else, I'm banking on their success. Hey, that's all right. <laughs> so do you still have a mentor today? Uh, yeah, I have a few, yeah. Uh, one of them is Noah, of uh, Noah Fine Art, Noah Elias. Um, he, he is, you know, like I was working on this fish illustration, I've never drawn fish before and, and like, and I was just like, man, I just can't make this thing look great. Like, I don't know how to draw a fish. I'm drawing like a sea bass. It's not particularly like a, you, there's not a lot of like sea bass out there. You're like, man, shit, man, that's a cool sea bass. Like, <laughs> never do that. And so I, yeah. I, I, I sent a screenshot to him and was like, look, man, can you make this look cool? Like, how do I make it look better? And he goes and takes it and he like, he put some highlights in on his own like tablet or something and then sent it back to me and was like, here's what I would do. And I was like, you genius. Like, and, and when you, when you work either by yourself or or the world in which you're working on when you're working on kind of elite more elite products like there's not a lot of people you can go like uh, hey man how can you make this better because some people will just say well it looks great as it is I you need people who have that experience that can actually elevate your level of design and I'm just super thankful to have someone like him and there's another couple guys who you know I'll you know Ty Matson I'll hit up for kind of advice about marketing um, and then uh, Rob McCarty and, and Aaron Hennings are two guys who are heads of their companies Visla and Stance which are great companies and before I released my most recent product I was like hey you know take a look at this you know and and both of them signed off on it in different ways and kind of were like yeah this is a cool thing and it's just kind of cool to have those guys in your space to kind of corroborate what you're doing and and tell you whether it's good or bad or you know candid feedback so totally it's huge um i don't feel enough enough freelancers have people in their lives that are doing that and it's sort of and it's a really like isolating lonely place to be absolutely yeah i mean i mean being working by yourself being in your own head all the time like it's it, you really need to figure out a way to elevate your level of design you need to progress you know progression is important you know because um if you want to make more money if you want to get more exposure if you want to do new things you have to get better and you kind of have to take some risks along with that you know um, and I think being a freelancer is the perfect opportunity to take those risks. And um, a lot of people don't take risks either because they have like a full time job or they're, you know, they're worried about salary or those kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, that that's a question that I'd love to dive into because it's something I'm, I'm constantly thinking at, about and it's something that I find myself sort of struggling with is progression um, yeah. in, in the element of like when you get to a level when you're successful. Mm -hmm. um, how do you then continue to, I, I, I've thought of this like with bands, you know, it's like yeah, yeah. when a band finally like hits it and now they're like selling out and like, where do they go from here? You know, and totally. um, same deal as like an artist at a certain point, um, how do you continue to progress when you're already good, you know? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I think it's trying new ventures. One thing I really uh, appreciate about someone like Ricky Gervais is like, you know, he made The Office, made two seasons of it and was like, two seasons is enough. That's it's great at two seasons, I wanna make something new. And he made something new. And I think there is a life expectancy to certain types of trades that you would be doing. You're gonna expunge all the creativity out of it that maybe you can, and get to a point where it kinda of becomes a little bit dead and lifeless, and you might need to move on to something new just so that you can be reinvigorated. You know, I imagine you've shot 1,000 million bazillion weddings. Right. Like, um, trying to come up with new ways to shoot weddings would be probably pretty difficult. But when you, um, when you throw on, topple on some new types of projects, some new types of photography, um, then it can get a little bit more exciting. And I think that same, same thing is true for design, you know. Um, the small brand that I have, Chomp, if I hadn't started doing that, and there is crossover, it relates to design a lot, and design is certainly a part of it, but a much bigger part of it is, is the financial part of it and the marketing side, which are things I don't really have to deal with. I mean, I cared about margins uh, other companies, and I certainly understood what made something uh, price appropriate, um, but I didn't have to use my own money to do it. And so that that matters now too. And then the marketing side of it, which I always thought, oh, I always thought <laughs> design sold good design, but really marketing sells good design. Um, and uh, and there's because there's so much good design out there. So. Um, these are things that I'm learning that I'm adding to my skill set that relate to design when, yeah, of course I would get bored you know, drawing log logos over time or, or making the same types of t-shirts over time. You can, you'll get really bored of that. So I think adding to your skill set is super, you know, that's valuable. I mean, you're, you're doing that a ton. You're doing the artist report. You're doing, I mean, 
there's no lack of hustle on your end, you know? I feel like I should be interviewing you. Like, <laughs> you have like 55 projects yeah. that you're working on at the same time. And, and that's sort of what I've sort of come down to people, because I like to ask, which I will ask you, is like, like <laughs> yeah. what, what would your like passion projects be or stuff that you're doing outside of like the work that you're doing to then keep you in some personal projects? That's yeah, the freaking word I was personal for. projects. Um, but yeah, for me, like a lot of it is like, I get really excited about building business or building businesses or coming up with cre- uh, companies. Like for me, that's really exciting. Or like the artist report and doing that and hearing stories from people and loving yeah. that. Um, and that that's sort of an outside creative outlet that's filling a yeah. void for me. Well, I, like I do find fulfillment in my work. Like there are very few like designers who, who get that. I feel really hashtag blessed about it because um, like great work begets great work. Um, so I, it was a rich get richer situation. When you leave Nike, um, people just assume you're a genius. I, I'm not a genius. I'm as fine as any other designer out there. I can solve your problem too. But uh, for some reason, when the swoosh is on things, it just makes people want to use you as a designer. And because of that, I was getting great work pretty much out the gate. I started working for Red Bull, started doing skateboard decks, started doing a bunch of other projects that were good projects that were creatively fulfilling. This is a really like rare thing. It's pretty unusual that you would get a project that you absolutely love and feel creatively fulfilled. And I've been feeling that way for the last couple of years. There are times like certainly in between there where I was working on some things that I, I thought were maybe not that interesting, but I really enjoy my job at this point. But I also have the personal project of Chomp that can really, I can really, there are no, there are no limitations to what I can make with that. And especially because I have friends that I can take all these favors from and just give them product from and, and they want to do cool things too. So it's like, I feel uh, really fortunate in that way. So I use use Chomp as a creative outlet because I also see a, sk- a gap in the marketplace where Chomp kind of fits right in, which is like doesn't take itself too seriously. Is kind of one part entertainment, one part you know product, and 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 trying to get engagement around that is really fun and interesting. And it's different than just when I used to just design T-shirts and be excited when I saw someone wearing a T-shirt, which. Right you know, happens a lot if you work for Nike or, or Billabong. Yeah. And honestly, if you walk up to somebody and tell them like, hey, I designed your t-shirt, they'll just think you're the weirdest person ever. They don't ever <laughs> think it's cool. <laughs> I did it like twice, so yeah. I'll do it again. No, um, but I mean, what's so cool about Chomp and the way that you described it is basically a description of yourself. You know, totally. I don't feel like you take yourself too seriously. Totally. You're a bit comical, you're a bit fun. Yeah. You're, you know, it's like, what a, what a neat extension of yourself to be able to just like play with and oh, have yeah, people thanks. like it. Yeah, totally. I mean, the people responding to it is the thing I'm most excited because I actually had some friends say like, hey, I think you're going to go over people's heads with this. Like, I don't think people are going to understand it. And I was like, well, maybe, but it's what I want to make right now. And, you know, I, I believe, look, there, there uh, <laughs> what does Kanye West say? There are leaders and there are followers, but I'd rather be a dick than a blank. <laughs> and I think that what he's saying there is, um, look, you need to forge a path. Uh, you you want to be you want to be the first to to make something new, and I I value creativity, meaning original ideas and content, much more than other things. Even if it's something's not well designed, if it has a great concept behind it, like that's something I relate to. And so I feel like, especially with you look at social media, and uh, what's the uh, SoCality Barbie made a great satire of the ubiquitousness of of the culture of Instagram. Now. It, we could only be made fun of because we realize that all these things have become facsimiles of themselves, right? And so what I don't want Chomp to be or anything I make ever is a facsimile of something else. I want it to be 100% unique and interesting and and I value those things the most. The photographers that I look up to, I feel like they're making the original content that I want to be looking at. You know, the designers I look at to, they're thinking a different way. They're thinking almost like a hybrid fine artist designer and 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 they're making new things. So. As far as Chomp is concerned, I want to make something new, and I don't even know what the question was, but uh, that's perfect. Uh, How do you find the blend between what you just described, which is wanting to create un- basically original design and nothing that anyone else is doing, and then designing client work? Yeah, <clears throat> well, client. I mean, because client work sometimes 
can't be that original. And sometimes that originality is over people's heads when they're like, we actually just want this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you're trying to, the client work part is because, well, you work in weddings, so I imagine it's, you're working with a, you know, on occasion you're working with a bride. Bride has been on Pinterest for however many months before she's right. even gonna meet with you. So she has a vision for what she wants. Now, some clients are that way. Um, and I'm not saying all, 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 you know, brides are that way. I'm sure they want yeah. super original content, some of them. But, but you know, so you do have those clients that say, well, we're kind of using you as the hands, right? Um, but then you have other clients who are kind of using you as the hands and the head. We, we really want your ideas too. So we want, you know, the kinds of projects that I enjoy the most are the ones I get to pitch back on. Okay, hey, here's what I'm thinking uh, for this project. We have a problem and we want you to solve it. Um, and actually it's happening with Taco Bell. They just briefed me on a project. This is a thing that we're making. We don't know how to market it for sure. And we need you to add a visual piece to it, but we don't know what that is. And those are the kinds of projects that I want, which are, um, I don't know what it is either, but I'm gonna do some research. I'll pitch back to you what I think are good ideas and then we'll pick one and we'll move forward. And you kind of want to be in that that spot, right? right. Um, where you have the skill and the craft to make the things that people need, but you also have the, the brains to make it happen doesn't always happen like that obviously you get creative briefs and they're pretty rigid and kind of just making something for someone else and, and that happens um but uh, i believe solely that if you if it is a passion of yours if your if your career is a passion this is something that you would be doing regardless you would i would be making things regardless i would be, be drawing things regardless and that's true to a point and so in my my free time i i make shit you know, I, I want to make stuff, so, and and it's valuable to me. So, but I get a huge mix now of like client works who who they're just ask, asking for the demands of what my hands can make. Then some people who are asking my hands and my brain. Some people who are just looking for the ideas for me to bounce off of their meeting. And then other times that I'm just making things that are coming straight out of my brain that I feel like I should share with the world or make funny fun of something or satire or something. You know, like. And, and, and those are all creatively fulfilling. And, but I also think you should be able to, you know, in your craft, replicate the thing that the person needs. You know, if a bride comes to you and says, I want this type of shot, this type of filter, you, if you can't do that, then you haven't really mastered your craft, but you can. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think that's valuable too. I just, I, I want to stress that part because I think that totally. Yeah, no, it's more so how do you like blend those things and you know for photography whenever I'm Sort of teaching other photographers or sort of how I approach client work and stuff like that. It's like um, I heard someone else say this art striver who's a big commercial photographer But basically he's like when I approach commercial work I always know the client wants something and I'll shoot it's basically one for them one for yeah. me yeah. You know where it's like I will design I will, I will shoot the shot that they've described that they want mm -hmm. But then on top of that I'll shoot what I want Totally. They're either going to like my shot better or I just like my shot better and that's okay too. And I have my shot that I can use in my portfolio totally. and they still, they're still happy, but I'm still happy. And I do that a lot with weddings yeah. where it's like, I know mom and dad are going to want these sort of shots. Um, so I'm going to get them, but I'm still going to get them in a really loose and fun way. Yeah. But then I'm also going to get the stuff that's a little bit more creative. And then people are going to love sometimes that, or maybe I'm just going to love that and that's okay too. But you also have the taste, like there's another part of it that you have the taste that you wouldn't make something bad at all. Right. You might make something that you don't want to make. That might not be your taste. But then there are times that I actually have been briefed on projects where what they want is bad. Mm -hmm. What they want is like not good design or it's unoriginal or it's ubiquitous and it's been everywhere. Right. And I'm, I'm, I try to get away from that or advise them in different directions. But I think, you know, you don't want to present someone a concept that you don't like, right? So if they pick something that you consider to be bad, that's on you. You made that bad thing, right? So there are there have been times where I presented a concept I didn't really want because I felt like I needed three concepts and, and they picked the concept I didn't want them to pick. And whose fault is that? It's my fault. I still right. made the thing. It's not their fault for choosing it. I can, you know, I can guide their taste as much as they want, but you know, as far as as far as making things go, you know, that's on me. So um, th those are things that I think about, you know, uh, when I'm making my craft and, you know, presenting ideas and those kinds of things. Yeah. You know, less is more sometimes.
totally. That, that same photographer, Art, was describing that same exact concept where basically it's like, he's like, I do an extremely, extremely hard edit um, on my photos that I present. They may, Maybe I've shot like a thousand that day. They're getting three to yeah. choose from, yeah. you know, because I don't want them choosing this photo because I don't want my name stuck to it. And that's hard because you do want to, sh- you want to show that you did a lot of work. Right. Like, um, and there's some part of like that where it's like, yeah, you want to know, want them to know that you expunged all the ideas and that you, you know, whatever. So you want to show more concepts and it's just a bad idea. Like in the long run, cause you're, you're opening yourself. You're not guiding, you're not using your expertise to guide them. Yeah. You know, you're letting them use their know how, right. how, you know, to make it happen. Interesting flip side of that. I was talking with uh, Mark Hemian, who's a designer at Google, um, used to be a designer at Google, but he worked on, the design for YouTube. And right. and he was describing how they all were wanting the YouTube logo to be red. And he's like, that's the stupidest idea ever. And he did every other color. And he's like, after doing every other color, I mean, they ended up being right. You know, <laughs> and it's like red was the way to go. And it was through like market research and people clicking and all that sort of stuff. It's like, so yeah, in, interesting. Yeah, you gotta know when to hold them and know when to fold them for sure. Totally. There, I mean, there been lots of times that, that's the other thing is like, I never take the assumption that my clients don't know anything. A lot of times they've made my projects better. You know, in, in the example of the fish drawing, like he's right. What I presented to him was not my best effort because I felt like I didn't know how to draw a fish, but I hadn't taken the time on my side to really, to really research like what would make something look great. And, and so he, that's just one of the many examples this year of people, you know, helping clients basically who maybe aren't designers at all making my work better and that's designers don't have a monopoly on taste like it's a it's a false notion um in the community design where it's like it's kind of a us versus them situation i think that's kind of going away a little bit because you know smarter people are starting to talk more about it but there's a website uh uh clients from hell or something like that that. yeah and i don't you know, I don't really back it because I don't like the us versus them right. mentality. You know, some of your your clients' bad, you know, feedback or or unintelligible or, or weirdly critical but doesn't make any sense feedback is, is because you haven't walked them through the steps of totally. understanding what it is and, and met, meeting people where they're at. Um, and just because someone doesn't have the language doesn't mean that they don't have the taste. You know, for example, like I work with... Uh, work on a magazine called BHL and the editor isn't really like a designer like he you know the guy who runs his magazine he's he's a he's got good taste and he might not know every design language or whatever but we make together is really great so I could limit his feedback at times if he if if he wasn't using a certain design term or 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 not following my logic but he's always helped me make something good. And and so, yeah, it's easy to discredit anyone who doesn't sit behind a computer or sit behind a camera or whatever, but uh, they, they have taste too. I mean, they know what's up. But, you know, also they have Pinterest and Instagram too. So they're like a lot of the same things you do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how I would love to hear a bit about, um, I feel like a lot of, young young kids you know younger people yeah. basically want to go straight into freelancing or straight into like starting their own clothing company or that sort of stuff how much would you say the route that like if you were to just start freelancing without having worked at billabong without having worked at nike where would that have you but more so talk about the value or non-value that you find going the route that you did with art school and then working for bigger companies before going freelance yeah well uh, you know, it's a mastering of the craft itself, right? Understanding how things are made and how the process works is something that uh, can't be manufactured through freelance. Um, it can be taught by other freelancers to you, but how to work with clients, how to get new clients, how to uh, set up files to be printed, these kinds of things are, 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 aren't always just taught in school and then they are learned in an occupation, an actual trade. So had I not worked at Billabong, I would have never known how to make a repeat so that I could make a repeating garment, which we just we are doing one right now. Uh, if had I not worked at Nike, I would not understand how marketing works with products to you know develop ideas and and sell ideas. Um, and so there are there are real practical applications like learning how 
peril is made, how trapping works, how separations work, that, that makes your job a lot easier and gets you to the solution on, on making things, you know, that, that look the way you want them to. And then there's another side of it, which is, um, you know, the creative briefs and these other skills that you really learn at these places that you just, you can't really learn on your own unless you see someone do them first or someone shows you how to do them. I didn't learn them in school. So I needed to take, you know, I needed to have the real world apparel experience. So I really value that part of it. So I, I probably would recommend that people don't start freelancing first and that they kind of learn some, if you want to learn how to do editorial, like go spend work as, at a magazine and understand how, how the, you know, the printing press works or how to set up files and how to embed fonts or, or whatever other thing that you need to learn that is just things that maybe you forget or, or, or don't learn in school. And um, I mean, this guy, I work with a print broker and he's constantly complaining about great designers that I know that aren't setting their files up right, you know? So th there's like, you know, there's this, there's this disconnect there of like the, the real practical application of how, how shit gets made. Um, and uh, I'm, meeting, I'm meeting with, uh, you know, Czar Press, like a local press here, it does awesome letterpress stuff. And they screen printed my recent posters. And I was talking to the separator and separations is, the diff is like how the screens go down, right? So it's like, um, if you have a, a three color screen print, like it goes lightest to darkest, okay? And so, and the darkest one goes on because of trapping and it has to do with registration. So if the black one is, isn't is last, you might see registration issues, okay? So this is a real brief like insight into like how this works. And I sit down with them and I'm like, hey, have you ever learned this trick? There's this one button on the Pathfinder tool that will separate all your artwork for you. And, and he's like, dude, show me. So I show him, I expand all the outlines, I push the button, blows his mind, right? So. I only knew about that button because someone showed me it at Billabong and showed me how to do separations. No, I've never taken a para class and, right. and he only knows about it because I just happened to be in the room and told him about it. So it's not like I'm some wise dude, somebody else told me and you know, and, and so on and so forth. Now there are things like that that you can uncover in a in an experience when you're at a job, you know, that are just little things that are going to get you to the to the point that you need so that you can actually make the product that you want. And so and I'm having conversations with the printer guy and he's going, you know, this is going to save me so much time, but also how many designers don't know how to separate their artwork and set up files to send is like this is it's it's amazing. So um so I think that's valuable. I think that's a trade. But then I think the freelance experience is is really cool because you're forging your own path. You're creating your own business. You're eating. You're eating because you works right. So like I don't have oh, now I have passive income, but I don't have a ton of passive income. Like I couldn't just not work for the next t two months and, and see residual income. So um, that's what's valuable about freelance is that you kind of have to make your own way. Um, and if you don't work, you don't eat. And I, I really like that part. But uh, as they relate together, I feel like kind of need some of the more practical application stuff first uh, before you, you know, forge your own path. Or you're basically reinventing a wheel that's already been created and exactly. perfected and done really well. Totally. By companies like Nike. Totally. It, you <laughs> Right. It, I learned from the best, right? You know, I, I mean, some of these experiences, I hate them, right? I hated learning how to do a repeat. I hated tabbing artwork and sending it across to China and sending one email and then waiting a day for the, it to come back to work on production to try to understand how the product is made and then eventually get dropped. And that experience, as much as it was you know, horrible sometimes, it is so valuable because it's how the world works. Um, and, and had I not had mentors or bosses or people to show me how those things work, I probably wouldn't have those skills. I would, I would be in the same place that I was before. I might be a better illustrator because you know I'll be trying new things all the time, but I wouldn't really know how shit gets made. Um, and that's a that's definitely. I read an article. That's definitely the biggest criticism of like designers is 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 not really knowing how product gets made that much, how things get manufactured, and 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 that's. I mean, how many kids you talk to? You're all digital. They don't understand anything about how 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 regular you know projectors can make photography. It's like, 
you, there's probably no one photo flow fixer you know <laughs> developer like doing this process they don't know anything about it and and they just live in a different world and and if they were to cross over might naively think like yeah i could figure this thing out but how much harder it is to shoot with film and that's really the thing i'm talking about is like you can design something great on a computer and make something beautiful but if you can't make that artwork apply to the actual product that it's going to be made on you are missing a huge step huge i mean interesting to hear your thoughts on sort of instagram success you know in terms of like how many how popular has like hand-drawn illustration become and yeah. you know like you had a couple little satire posts on that yeah. sort of stuff um, but but for those sort of illustrators who all of a sudden get popular and start getting work from instagram like photography it's happened like crazy yeah you know there's but without actually having the business side and being able to take care of clients and that sort of deal can you maybe yeah. talk about that a bit well i would say i get almost no work from, through instagram right. um and i think that's good because uh, for me i would say it's good because the work that has been solicited through instagram for me hasn't been very valuable work to me it's usually just like 14 year olds being like can you design my tattoo and I'm like I, I don't know i can't do that but <laughs> or you should have a tattoo or design your tattoo or something you know um uh, so I, I'm really curious to know the kinds of work that these this guys get, you know, because I I don't know. I don't know what it's like to have 100,000 followers or, right. or whatever. But I know that the more followers you have, the more emails you get, and the more you have to filter through who's good and who's bad. Now, I would say, like, um, the people who are getting the best work are the ones who are directed towards a certain client, and they're, they're aiming their business at that client. So someone like Ty Matson, like, that guy doesn't take dumb work. Like, he might have some work that, like, you know, pays the bills. I don't know about it. But he's aiming straight at the companies that he wants to work for. And he gets cool work. So, like, so as Instagram success relates to product, I think if you sell product, Instagram is really, really valuable. If you want certain clients, that's really has less to do with Instagram. It has more to do with who you're aiming your business development at. Um, and there are ways to get good clients. And I don't think getting great clients means having a lot of followers. And so I, I think those things are not really totally related. I'm not saying they're, I'm not saying no one who has 100,000 followers hasn't gotten a great client out of it. I'm just saying um, someone can have 1,000 followers and they can be aimed straight at the client they want and developing the business they want and getting better clients than someone who has 100,000 followers. Not always, but yeah, for sure. Because People want to know that you can make stuff and they want to know that you have good ideas. And whether you have a large following or not is only valuable if you sell product. It is most valuable when you sell product right. or you market something. So that's a lesson to anyone who has a lot of followers. If you're not making something and selling it or endorsing a product, you, you need to be. Um, because that's how things get sold. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, I mean, what do you think? I mean, what do you think about it? I mean, like, there's there's got to be photographers out there with like a bajillion fo bajillion followers. Oh, I mean, yeah. are they working more or less? Are they working on things they like more or less? I, I was really curious. I think I think it's allowed for people to people who weren't photographers who now have a crazy following on Instagram through taking pictures on their iPhone are now getting landing jobs and traveling and getting flown to Iceland and getting, you know, getting paid to do a lot of things. But I also know a lot of friends, I have friends that have a really big following on Instagram. They're barely charging anything for the weddings that they're shooting and they have like hundred plus thousand followers. And I feel like they need to be valuing what they have more totally. than what they're giving. Well, and that's that probably has more to do with them not being maybe either mentored or, or brought up in the in the in the culture of what photography should should yeah. be like or what should be charged, right? So I think there's prestige, right, which is like one part of like having a big following, which is valuable, and it's something that you could add to your resume for sure. Um, it, you know, if you know, good friend John Paul Douglas is constantly being hit up by you know, great companies to make something really good. He has a really large following. But when you look at his work, you can just tell, it's not just something like that you want to look at, like a beautiful, you know, ocean view or sunset or what. It's not, it's not, it's not, not that that's tripe or something like that, but uh, it's not, 
wholly original. When you look at somebody like John Paul, it's like this guy's manufacturing ideas and you want to be a part of those ideas. And and the medium is photography, but it really could be anything. And and that's what's valuable about him. And I, I think, I actually think the public can discern the difference between the two. And p- particularly people who are looking to work with photographers can to distinguish the difference between the two. I think there are people who have a large following who, who have great f- photographs, but they're not sexy in the way that um, brands would want to hire them because the content is, uh, the narrative is so specific to that person or something, or it's right. one note or whatever. And they might want to give them product to like tag in their Instagram, but they might not want to hire them as photographers. And I think that might be the same way with design. You know, there's like a ton of lettering out there, like people doing hand lettering, like nonstop. Right. I think that's a cool skill set, but um, I have a lot of criticisms of it because for one, not everyone needs hand lettering, especially if you're making something that ends up looking typeset, which I've seen a lot of guys do. It's like, if you're drawing a perfect Baskerville font, why not just type out something in Baskerville? It's like no point in drawing it. So my my thing about that is like, uh, it's it's the meet the needs of, of your clients, right? So it's great if you can do lettering, but if not that many people need lettering, then you're kind of in a niche market and maybe needs to move on. So, um, and so, and so people follow those accounts because they're interested and they think they're fun. Brands follow accounts for different reasons or hire accounts for different reasons. They're looking at things differently. They want to know that they have a problem and you can solve it in a certain way. Um, you know, but there are some cool things that happen over the collaborative experience that are, you know, either cross Instagram genres, which would be something like Chomp and Kook Slams, where the market is really similar between the accounts. And because of that, we can create a product and people will be interested in it. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in that for those guys who have huge followings. Um, Sorry, I just had like a, that was a huge long run on. No, it was good. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think a lot of that, too, having the following too, the, you're getting hired by brands for two different, I mean, different reasons. When you have a huge following, a lot of it could just be brand awareness, you know, and totally. being you know being able to get into someone's feed that way that has yeah. over 100,000 followers. Yeah, I mean, um, my buddy who does the cut paper stuff, like it, he, he makes really beautiful cut paper stuff, but I think also people care about his audience and stuff. So when he posts about, exactly. yeah, I mean that they're, they're trying a little bit of, a little bit of native advertising there or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you go back into, I, I'd love to just hear, um, and then we'll wrap up sort of soon, but, um, the transition going from working for Nike and then deciding to go freelance and how that was. Cause I know it wasn't necessarily the easiest oh, mental man, place. Was, uh, absolutely. I mean, you knew the anguish I was going through of like yeah. leaving that experience. At that time, my wife is a hustler and she works super hard, but she wasn't working at that time. It was kind of in between jobs. And I was being pressed up against the wall and I was going to have to make a decision on whether I was going to leave or whether I was going to stay. Uh, so many, I mean, there's so many reasons to stay. Like I, when I left, I mean, there were definitely people who were like, what? Why are you, why are you? You're leaving the biggest apparel company in the world, you're a designer for them. Essentially, you have the promise of like keeping your career there for the rest of your life. I can be making, you know, uh, you know, as much money as I want to a point, you know, with the, with all the travel and stuff that goes along with it. You know, I'm not rich, but I, I think it has more to do with, um, you know, I've said this before, but it's like it, I was only working out one muscle when I went to the gym, essentially, you know, I'm just working out biceps. My biceps are huge, you know, like I can design the shit out of t-shirts, but I'm not working on these other muscles that I, I feel like I have and I could work out and, and, and I'm just not getting the opportunity to do that. And so they're starting to atrophy and I'm now all just biceps. And, and if I don't make this leap right now, you know, in my mid late twenties, then I'll forever be cornered into being a t-shirt designer, maybe a creative direct or director on t-shirts. You know, that's, it just wasn't for me, it wasn't totally appealing, you know, <laughs> There's lots of reasons why you should stay, but it, uh, it just seemed like there are more reasons to leave. And and making the decision was uh, giving me tons of anxiety. So um, I made the decision, and and Nike gave me a severance package. And so it was like it was just the amount of money that I needed to feel totally okay with doing whatever I wanted. Now, I I'll be admit I'm kind of a pussy because I didn't like I might not have made that decision if they weren't going to give me money to leave. You know, um, and so while I tell other people quit your job and do your own thing, like I maybe I'm a little bit of a hypocrite because I, I quit and got money, you know. So, or rather, I got laid off because I was going to get moved or something, you know. And so I opted out, and, and just like you either had to move up to Seattle or yeah, leave. Yeah, it was either move to Portland or or leave. And so, um, 
And so I didn't go and, you know, I, I hit the ground running because, you know, fear, fear of losing all your money or going broke is a great fear to have because it'll, it'll teach you some hustle. Um, I think, I don't know. I mean, if you've ever been in a financial pitch like, and you need to make money, you'll find a way to make money. I was, I was gonna be massaging people's feet for money. I'll do whatever <laughs> it takes to keep myself alive and, and whatever. So I uh, hit the ground running and that's when I learned a, little, a lot how to be resourceful about getting the clients that you want, you know, and having a portfolio that you really stand behind. Um, and then, and then just soliciting work, man. I just sent like hundreds and hundreds of emails. Like I was like, I was asking anybody for money. If they were around here, I told them I'll be working in the house. My, my rate was so low. I was, you know, charging 500 bucks a logo, just banging them out, whatever it took, you know? And, and that client, the clientele starts to build on itself. People start to hire you and over and over again. And then, and then you start to get the clients that you really want. And it's that hustle that really makes it worth worthwhile. So a homie was talking to me recently and he's like, you know, I kind of work for the man and I, but I have all this other skill sets that I want to do, but I don't really have a ton of savings. And I was like, but that's kind of great because you don't have a ton of savings. So I know for sure you're going to start making money right away. You're going to, tr- you're going to find any way to make that money. So you don't have a choice. You, exactly. And, and we, it seems more dangerous to us than it really is. Like, like for example, had we gone absolutely broke, I could find money somewhere. A friend would loan me a thousand bucks if I needed to pay rent or something like that. But if they knew I was working, you know, and I could pay them back. We're, we don't live, we don't live in the world where we're gonna go homeless because we didn't make a couple bills. If you have hustle, you're gonna be fine. And, and I'm not telling you it's okay to be totally irresponsible with your finances, but you just gotta know that, that rock bottom for you really isn't like a total rock bottom. It's just like a financial stress thing and you're gonna get through it. I mean, but financial stress is stress. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it can be scary. Like for some people they love, sometimes for me, it's like, I just wish I got a paycheck. You know, that sometimes sounds really nice, you know, but then on the flip side, um, being able to sort of drive your own success is also very exciting and then also totally. keeps the drive going. The times I wish I had a paycheck would be like, man, shit, I got a lot of money out there right now. And if one of those guys didn't pay me, we might not be feeding my dog dog food this week, you know? Um, and and that the thing about having essentially two small, very small businesses is I have a lot of money going out and a lot of money coming in, but or maybe less money coming in than I have going out sometimes. And so you're looking at your bank account and you either look like a college kid or you look like a professional. And, and so that, that gets a little nerve wracking at times, but you kind of get a little bit more comfortable with that kind of experience. You know, I'm, I'm sure you have this, you know, invoicing process. You're like, yeah, this person hasn't paid me for 50, 60 days or something like that. You're like, this is not that cool right now. So the clients that I keep around tend to be the ones who play, pay sooner than the, than the other totally. ones. I had a client did pay me for 60 days. One time we were having like, Oh, uh, an argument about it over text and then over a phone call and and it put a lot of things in perspective, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's the worst. Um, well, a couple more questions and we'll wrap up. Um, we'd love to just hear your thoughts on what you feel success is. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Huh? It could, s- could be like for you, like what's success, but then also like if you look like, or what makes someone successful? Yeah, I mean, it just depends on the life, where the life you want, and where um, where you are in your the seasonality of life too. Which is like right now, I just want to make stuff. I want to make really cool stuff. I don't have any kids. Um, I just have an epic wife. She works and and an and, epic dog. and yeah, I have an epic dog. And we like to eat out. We like to have fun. We like to go on trips. So uh, I, you know, there's money for for spending, but you know, I don't live in a huge house like. I don't necessarily want a huge house. I'll drive like an old forerunner. I'll probably always drive an old forerunner, but that's just me, right? But if I had kids, you know, I'm in your situation, I have three kids, like, you know, making quarter million dollars a year would seem pretty enticing and I would be doing a lot of more things to do that. But right now for me, I want, I want to be really wealthy in my portfolio. I want it to have this thing where people look at the ideas that I make and the things that I make and they go, um, I, he can write his ticket to what what he wants to do next. You know, I want that to be it. Um, and and sure, I don't have a ton of money in my bank account. You know, at certain times, but um, I am picking the clients that I want at times. You know, I'm really like 
I'm pushing, forging towards something that is making something better at times, you know? And, and that to me is success right now, right? So if I continue to do that, but then I make the same amount of money for the next five years, I might not be this, I might not be considering myself as successful, right? So there is a monetary side of it, not totally. You don't have to be, you know, you have making a quarter million dollars to be successful, but, uh, but if I'm still doing the same exact thing, still running a small chomp brand, still doing the same exact design five years from now, I wouldn't really consider it successful. But I would say right now, I'm at a life stage that I wanna be in. But you know, everyone is different at different points. And so when I have a little bit more overhead, a little bit more baggage, I think I'll have to reinvent what that looks like. But for now, I, I feel uh, very excited about what's happening. Yeah. Rad. Um, and then what do you think, like as just people, because you're surrounded by some pretty talented, amazing designers, artists, mm-hmm. illustrators. Um, what do you find is a common thread in either personality or like what, what makes someone, there's a lot of people out there, what makes someone more, ta- I mean, successful? Like what's, what's a quality that you see? Yeah, like, is hustle, there- hustle is the most important thing. Like my older brother and I were talking, we're just kind of having a conversation back and forth. And he went to a two year school and, um, and he's a designer and he, uh, and he's, he's pretty reasonably successful. So he's not, he's not, he's not eating ramen. He's, he lives right by the beach and he has a house with a pool. He's, he's pretty stoked. And I have a four year degree and, um, yeah, I'm doing okay. But the common thread between somebody who has a two year degree, someone has a four year degree, someone who has no degree and, and is doing well is hustle. It has more to do with that than it does have to do with how much school you have. So, so, and when I look at other designers are out here, some, you know, the hoods was they quit school, I think. They don't even think they finished and they were just doing school and they, and they were like, oh, I'm learning more in the real world. I want to do this thing. Um, and so I think the common thread between all these people who I meet, these people who I look up to, someone like you, someone, you know, anybody who's in our creative community has to do with hustle. And, and it has to do with uh, like being willing to put stuff out there, you know, like, there's been times I made stuff that sucked and I put it out there, you know, that things weren't perfect, you know, and, um, you know, posters that didn't sell all the way through, you know, I have artwork that, that didn't resound with some people and maybe didn't get as much marketing as I thought. But, but the hustle part of it is that you're just going to keep doing it. You're just going to keep making ideas over and over again. You're going to keep manufacturing things. You, you want the best clients. You want to make work. And this is something that's valuable to you. So hustle is, is the most important thing. Hard putting in hard work. And most of the people I know in my creative community, some, someone like you, the guys who are all connecting things, these guys hustle. Like this is what they want to do. So, and you know, yeah, that, that's, that's the quality for me for success. And, and it's not really school and it's not even really, honestly, like talent is like fleeting. You might be really talented at some point in your life and then people catch up to you or, or the, the entire culture catches up to you. Think about how much better photography is because Instagram is around. Like, like people were able to look at photography and see what it is and how lighting works and how, how to even edit their own photos and this kind of thing. And, and photography has gotten better as a medium. And, and so I'm not saying that's just because of Instagram, but the, you know, hand lettering is a genre of design that has gotten insurmountably better because of of that culture around Instagram. So making stuff, putting it out there and hustling to to make it happen, I think those are the most valuable things. Huge, huge piece of advice. So where can people find all your stuff? Is it Yeah, go to I prefer you just follow my brand, chompbrand.com. I mean you can follow me on Instagram, it's doodles and pictures of me and my dog and my wife, you know, but uh Joshua Ariza. Joshua is my website. Joshua underscore Ariza is my Twitter, Instagram, whatever else. If you want to see me make fun of design or joke around or, but if you want to laugh, follow my brand. I think you'll like that. Yeah. Chomp brand. Epic. <laughs> um, hey, thanks so much for your time. Loved hearing. You had some, those are like really, really valuable piece of wisdom. So thanks. I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Hey. Thank you. <laughs>